In computer science, the Y Combinator is considered one of the most beautiful and intriguing ideas. It also has a reputation of being very difficult to understand, which I think is undeserved. But it's certainly not easy and a very good challenge if you like programming and you want to test yourself. This video is dense, but gives a complete explanation. So, brace yourself. The context is the study of computer languages, and more specifically, finding the simplest programming language that is as powerful as any other language, like C, for example. This very, very simple programming language is called Lambda Calculus. It's ridiculously simple, as it's only composed of function definitions and function calls. In Lambda Calculus, you can't write loops or if statements, you can't use variables, there are no simple types like booleans or numbers, but even without all that, it can still compute anything a classic language like C can. By the way, this was invented in the 1930s, but even today you'll see that some modern programming languages refer to anonymous functions as lambdas. Let's see what lambda calculus looks like. I will write examples in JavaScript. A function taking one argument and just returning it, the so-called identity function, looks like this. The arguments are on the left side of the row and the returned value on the right. Notice that the function has no name, but it can be used as a value. So you can use functions as arguments of other functions. That's what we see here. This is a function that takes two arguments, the first one being the function f. It returns whatever the function f returns when it's called with the second argument a. This last example shows what you can't do. It uses a variable and the numbers, neither of which exists in lambda calculus. Lambda calculus is just about defining and calling functions, yet it can compute everything a modern programming language can. I can see two reasons why it's incredible. One, how do you represent simple types like booleans and numbers or simple if statements? And two, how do you deal with repetition, so loops and recursion? This second question, dealing with recursion, is solved by the Y Combinator. But let's start with the first question. The first question is, how do you represent numbers and booleans? It's actually easier than it looks. In lambda calculus, you can only define functions, so booleans, true and false, have to be functions, which is very counterintuitive. Let me define true as a function with two arguments and returning the first one, like so. False is a function of two arguments returning the second one. Notice that I'm cheating as I'm defining the true and false variables, and there is no such thing as a variable in lambda calculus. Actually, it's not an issue, as every time I'm using a variable, I could just substitute it for its value and get the same result. So it's just a shortcut and makes everything simpler to read. Now that we have booleans, we want to define classic boolean operators. Let's say not. You can pause and try to define it for yourself. Not takes one argument, a boolean, so one of the two functions we just saw before. Imagine that this argument is true, a function that returns its first argument. So if the argument is true, then we should return not of true, so false. The same reasoning if the argument is false. We can try and see that it works as expected. Not true should be false, which returns its second argument, in this case the string false. Okay, it works. From now on, in my examples, I will use numbers and if statements as if they existed in lambda calculus, because we could define them similarly to what we just did with booleans. Of course, it's a shortcut, but obviously, even if defining everything with just functions is theoretically possible, in practice it would be unreadable. This was the appetizer. Now to the second, more fundamental question. How can we deal with repetition, that is, loops or recursion? A loop can actually be replaced by a recursive call, 
So we just need to talk about recursion. Take the iconic example of the factorial function implemented recursively. The recursion stops when n equals 1. Otherwise, factorial n is n factorial n minus 1. In order to have the function called itself, we need to give it a name. And the body of the function, of course, refers to this name. That's basically how recursion works. In order to name the function, I've assigned it to a variable, something that we can't do with lambda calculus. So without variables, how could a function refer to itself? We can't assign values to variables, but we can bind values to arguments. So let's define a new function, factorial gen, that takes the factorial function as an argument and returns the factorial function. You can see that it returns the factorial function as the function body is basically the same as the classical factorial function we saw before. But instead of referring to a variable to perform the recursive call, we use the argument of factorial gen. Let me emphasize because it's important, and we'll need it later, factorial gen takes the factorial function as an argument, but it also returns the factorial function. If we want to call factorial gen, we have to provide the factorial function as an argument, which is precisely the function we try to define. So it looks like we haven't solved anything. Now consider calling factorial gen with a fake function that always throws an error. In JavaScript, we would write factorial gen of null. It returns a broken version of the factorial function, one that only works for the argument 1, which doesn't need to do any recursive call. If factorial gen of null returns a broken factorial function, factorial gen of factorial gen of null is also a broken version of the factorial function, but one that works a bit better. It works for arguments 1 and 2. It can perform 0 or 1 recursive call. We can continue this to get factorial functions that work with more and more values. And ultimately, we really want to compute an infinite stack of calls to factorial gen, which is, as you might have guessed, what the Y combinator computes. Also notice that because this stack of function calls is infinitely deep, we'll never get to the bottom of it. So factorial gen of null will actually never be called, and it can just be removed. Keep this factorial gen function in mind, because we'll soon get back to it. For now, our first step towards the Y combinator is to produce an infinite loop. Personally, I find it amazing that it's possible to create an infinite loop with such a primitive language, and the way it's done is just brilliant. Consider this function which takes itself as an argument, meaning that G will be bound to this same function. I know it's puzzling, but bear with me. We have to refer to this function twice, once to call it, once to pass it as an argument to itself. To do this, I'm assigning it to the variable h, and then I call h of h. So I call h with itself as its own argument. You can see that it creates an infinite loop. When you call h with itself as an argument, it returns g of g, and g is actually bound to h. So it returns h of h, just what we began with. But in lambda calculus, we can't assign variables. So how do we get rid of it? The answer is very simple. We just duplicate the definition of this function. You can see that it triggers a stack overflow when I evaluate this in a JavaScript interpreter. We are actually already very close to the Y combinator. Take the function h returning g of g. We modify it to return f of g of g, where f is some arbitrary function. As before, we call this modified function with itself as an argument. Now f is called at every iteration of this infinite loop. This mysterious function f can be any function you decide. We don't want to choose its value right now, so let's just pass it as an argument. What we get is the mighty y combinator. Let's see why it's so special. If we observe the Y Combinator for a moment, we can see that it returns whatever this function returns, 
and it's actually what the function f returns. Pause and try to see for yourself what the argument of f is. Its argument is g of g, so it takes whatever g returns as an argument. Look at what the function g is bound to here. Its return value is a call to the function f, so f takes as an argument whatever f returns. We've seen such a strange function before that takes as an argument what it returns, factorial gen. Its argument is the factorial function, and that's also what it returns. Let's see what happens if we use the y combinator with factorial gen. This is the y combinator called with a function f. It returns f of g of g. If you rewrite f of g of g and substitute g for its value here, you get this. Now notice that the argument of f is y of f. You can see it's exactly the first line. You get that y of f is equal to f of y of f. You can keep replacing y of f, so at the end you get f of f of f ad infinitum. That's the so-called fixed point of f. Now remember what we discussed previously. We can continue this to get factorial functions that work with more and more values. And ultimately, we really want to compute an infinite stack of calls to factorial gen. The factorial function is the fixed point of factorial gen. That means that y of factorial gen of 3 should return 6. If we try to evaluate this, unfortunately, we trigger a stack overflow. The problem comes from the evaluation of g of g, because it requires evaluating g of g itself, which triggers an infinite loop. The y combinator is computing all the factorial functions you might need during recursive calls, and there's an infinite number of those, because you can compute the factorial of an arbitrary larger number. But in practice, we know that at some point, we'll hit factorial of 1, which doesn't need any recursive call. We don't need to call the factorial function after that. Instead of computing this infinite series of factorial functions, let's just compute it when we need it. We do a lazy evaluation of g of g. Instead of writing g of g, we define a new function that takes as an argument n, and it's only if you call this new function that you actually compute g of g. We just take the y combinator, and every time we see g of g, we replace it with this new function that's lazy evaluating. Once you do that, you get the so-called z combinator that we can now try. The z combinator applied to factorial gen returns the factorial function. Calling it with the argument 3 should return factorial of 3, so 6. Congratulations if you made it this far, it's rather serious stuff. See you next time.